Well, hello and welcome to our daily prayer as we head towards the end of Lent now. I hope you've been, uh, as if enjoying is the right word, but journeying on this journey through to Easter, through Matthew's Gospel. And uh, today we're going to be praying for uh, the persecuted church around the world, for people who have injured, suffering. There's a reading from Philip Yancey's book uh, on Where is God When It Hurts? And we'll also be particularly remembering Miranda, Jan, Kate, Yazir, Dami, Jules, Anna, Michaela, JJ, Madison, Mitch, John, Fiona, Stephen, Nuline, and our own contacts and people of prayer today. So let's uh, pray together. We're on the, the daily prayer and liturgy you can get from our website. May God make speed to save us. May Lord make haste to help us. Hear our voice, O Lord, according to your faithful love. According to your judgment, give us life. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation, to you be glory and praise forever. In the darkness of our sin, you have shone in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God. In the face of Jesus Christ, open our eyes to acknowledge your presence, that freed from the misery of sin and shame, we may grow into your likeness from glory to glory. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Let's just hold before God our own thoughts and prayers in a, in a moment of quiet. As we rejoice in the gift of this time, say, may the light of your presence, O Lord, set our hearts on fire with love for you and for each other. Amen. And the Gospel is from Matthew and so uh, we're in the sort of the run-up to the crucifixion narrative. Verse, chapter 27 verse 1. Early in the morning all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. They bound him, led him away and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I've sinned, he said, I've betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. It's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went out and hung himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it's against the Lord to put this into the treasury. It's blood money. So they decided to build to buy the money uh, at the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. And that's why it's been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as God commanded us. Incredible, that was prophesied back in Jeremiah's day. And it comes to Jesus before Pilate. Verse 11, Matthew 27. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said, Don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? Jesus made no reply, not even a single reply to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, there was a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate said to him, Which one do you want me to release you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest they'd handed Jesus over to him. And while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with the innocent man, for I've suffered a great deal in a dream because of him today. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus, the Messiah, executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, said the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What should we do with Jesus, who's called the Messiah, Pilate said. They said, crucify him. What, what crime has he committed, said Pilate. They shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. And then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged. 
and handed him over to be crucified. And then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. They knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and they took his staff and they struck him on the head again and again. And after they'd mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him and they led him away to crucify him. So they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Africa, named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, and they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gal. And after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You're going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said. He can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. And then come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants. For he said, I'm the son of God. And in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those standing here heard this. They said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them got a sponge and he filled it with wine vinegar and he put it on a staff and he offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. But when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks spit, and the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. And many women were there watching from a distance. They'd followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Joseph and, and, and James, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea called Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he cut out of the rock. And he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days, I'll rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, and my God, in you I trust. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, in you I hope all day long. Remember, Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, O my God, in you I trust. Pause now to just allow the crucifixion story to 
sink into our hearts again and again. And we're asked today particularly to pray as we remember Jesus' suffering for those who too are suffering today. Give those in the persecuted church around the world, those closer to home suffering in emotional, spiritual, physical, mental ways. Remember the incredible distress that COVID has caused in majority world countries where provisions and vaccinations have been in much source of supply and no furlough or welfare schemes apply. We take time to dwell on Jesus' sacrifice in order that we might inherit eternal life free from sin, pain and distress of any kind. We, of course, know the, the great story of the cross is that the curtain in the temple was ripped in two and the very presence of God that previously had been hidden in the Holy of Holies was made available for all of us who believe in Jesus today. And God, who always is able to bring good even in the midst of suffering, Please bring incredible good in the midst of the suffering that is on our hearts to pray for today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As I finish today, I just wanted to read a couple of pages from uh, Philip Yancey's well-known book, Where is God When It Hurts? A comforting healing guide for coping with hard times. Um, I don't know if this is relevant to everyone today, but maybe for, for one or two of us. And it's, it's a detailed book with uh, many different uh, chapters in it. So it's not, not got a glib message. You might see some of the chapter titles here if it's, if it's of use to you uh, to reflect on. And I'm just going to reflect on one aspect, uh, which is a quote from Leo Tolstoy, that it is sometimes by those who have suffered that the world has been advanced as indeed it was on the cross. In his book, Creative Suffering, the Swiss physician and counsellor Paul Tournier recalls his surprise upon reading an article entitled Orphans Lead the World. The article, which appeared in a respected medical journal, surveyed the lives of 300 leaders who had had a great impact on world history. After searching for some common thread, the author discovered that all these leaders had grown up as orphans, either actually through the death or separation from their parents, or emotionally as a result of severe childhood deprivation. His list included names such as Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Robespierre, George Washington, Napoleon, Queen Victoria, Golda Meir, Hitler, Lenin, Stalin and Castro. So there we are, writes Tornier, giving lectures on how important it is for a child's development to have a father and mother performing harmoniously together with their respective roles towards him. And all at once we find that this is the very thing that those who have been most influential in world history have not had. Antonio himself was an orphan and he pondered the orphan phenomena soon after the death of his wife when he felt orphaned again in his old age. Previously he had judged each major event of life, success or tragedy as either good or evil, but now he began to perceive that circumstances, whether fortunate or unfortunate, are morally neutral. They're simply what they are. What matters is how we respond to them. Good and evil in a moral sense do not reside in things but always in persons. This insight changed the way Tournier approached medicine and led to his theory of the whole person. Only rarely are we the master of events, he said, as I suppose Jesus was on the cross, he enabled it and allowed it to happen to him. But along with those who help us, we are responsible for our reaction, which Jesus gets superbly perfect on the cross. Suffering is never beneficial in itself and must always be fought against. But what counts is the way that a person reacts in the face of suffering. That is the real test of a person, 
what is our personal attitude to life and its changes and chances? Here is a person sick or in the grip of some tragedy who confides in me. What are they going to make of the grievous blow that struck them? What is their personal reaction going to be? A positive, active, creative reaction which will develop their person? Or a negative one which will stunt it? The right help given at the right moment may determine the course of that person's life. So in his medical practice, Tournier saw wounded people every day. And he was quick to admit that suffering may push a person towards brokenness and not towards personal growth. That, in fact, was why he moved away from the traditional pattern of diagnosis and treatment and began to address his patients' emotional and spiritual needs as well. He felt an obligation to help them channel suffering as a transforming agent. Tournier used the analogy of a nutcracker. Unforeseen calamities apply force that can break through the hard outer shell of personal security. The act of breaking will cause pain, of course, but it need not destroy. To the contrary, in the right environments, the disarray can lead to creative growth when old routines and behavioural patterns no longer work. The patient exposed and vulnerable must seek new ones. The role of the doctor, nurse, social worker, minister or a loving friend is simply this, to keep the nutcracker of circumstances from destroying and to help the sufferer see that even the worst hardships open up the potential for growth and development. You know, what you're going through today or pondering on as you hear that, but however your life journey is going at the moment, may God give you grace to find in the example of Jesus, someone who bore suffering incredibly well and fruitfully for the lives of many. And indeed, because he had a picture of the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He knew where he was going. Uh, may God bless you with uh, energy to keep going and not be destroyed by whatever you're going through or the people you're praying for are going through. But look to the example of Jesus this Easter and know that the resurrection day comes not long after Good Friday and he can transform all things. Closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. May God bless you. Make his face to shine upon you and help you as you walk this road towards Easter now. Stay close to him. Amen.